Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Robert. I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) Through the grace of God, and because the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works, once I actually started working the steps, I've been sober since March 13th, 1990. I'm just incredibly grateful for that. I really appreciate Randy. I want to thank Randy. I want to thank the committee for having me. I want to thank Mike for taping, because that's just a tremendous service, and I made, wanted to make a point to thank him for that. But just, just by a show of hands, how many people grew up wishing that they would become an alcoholic <laughs> so they could get together with several other hundreds of alcoholics to hear somebody give a talk at 9.30 on a Saturday morning. Just by a show I <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain to you at least how I got here and hopefully how you can get something out of that. What I'm going to do is explain a little bit about what I was like, what happened, and what happened, and what I'm like now. And I, and I do that by working through some of my experiences with each of the steps, because it is the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that saved my life. So I'm going to start at step one, work through step 12. That'll keep me straight at where I'm at in my story, and, and keep you all straight about where I'm at in my story, too. But I would like to start at step one just to let you know that I, I qualify. I'm 13 years old. I get my hands on a half pint of Smirnoff Red Label vodka. And there's some woods over in front of the little junior high school I was going to at the time, and I got out in those woods by myself, cracked open the bottle, and drank it. Drank all of it. And nothing happened. Now, I didn't know what I thought was going to happen, But I'm angry because nothing happened (laughs) until I got into third period English class. (laughs) And I threw up all over the back of the classroom. And after I vomited, I wanted more. (laughs) Now that one story tells you all you need to know about me. I drank by myself, drank all I had. All I had was enough to make me sick. And after I got sick, I wanted more of the same thing that just made me sick. I got to tell you, back in the third grade, I got got my hands on some spoiled chocolate milk that made me sick enough to vomit. I hadn't had chocolate milk since. (laughs) But I drank a lot of that potato juice. And there was just something about it. And if y'all know what I'm talking about, just the magic. I can't describe it. I can't put it in words. If you know what I'm saying, you know. And if you don't know, I just I just don't can't describe it. But I knew right then alcohol was going to be a big part of my life. But then the trouble started. Now I'm 15 years old, and from 13 to 15, I'm, I'm a kid. It's not like I was drinking all the time. But when I drank, I was pretty good about I, I don't ever recall a time I started drinking and thought I've had enough. I don't ever recall a time. And I was pretty good, though, about finishing what I started, whatever I started. Until I'm 15 and I get my hands on some moonshine. I start drinking out of a mason jar full of moonshine at a little pool hall in Greenwood, South Carolina. I remember starting. The next thing I remember, I wake up and the, the guy that owned the place threw me in the back of his car once I passed out in there. And I came to in the back of his car, and I vomited all over myself. And I was terrified. Because I did not know how I had got there. Funny thing was, the second time that happened, it wasn't quite as scary. The tenth time, hundredth. Before it was said and done, that's just something that happened every so often. And that was the price I was willing to pay because after a while you can get used to that being normal. But I remember that first time. Now I'm 18 years old and I get pulled from my first DUI. And I've got to explain that to the family. 
explanation went something like this. Had a little too much to drink. I'll be careful. Never happened again. <laughs> My mother did not buy it. Because <laughs> you see, back when I was nine years old, my father was killed by a drunk driver. And she didn't have a clue why in the world I was putting somebody else's family at risk that way. But wasn't going to be a problem? It wasn't going to happen again. Now, when I promised my mother it wasn't going to happen again, I was not promising to stop drinking. <laughs> I wasn't even promising to stop drinking and driving. I was promising I'd be more careful. When I told you that that was my first DUI, it should have given you a clue that there were more to follow. (laughs) I got my second DUI when I was 20, and I got to spend some time on this because it gives you my attitude and outlook upon life at the time. 20 years old, I get the letter that I had been accepted to the University of South Carolina School of Law, going to law school. And I'm out celebrating. And I'm riding around my town, and I see the state trooper in my rearview mirror. I immediately look down and see that I'm going 45. It was a 45-mile-hour zone. So far, so good, right? But I ain't afraid of it. And I'm going to show them I'm not afraid of it. So I keep it dead at 45. I ain't slowing down for them. I ain't speeding. I don't want him to pull me, but I ain't slowing down either. Now, this was before the days of cruise control. So I'm staring at the speedometer to make sure I'm going right at 45. And I'm staring at the speedometer, and I look up in the rear view to see if he's still following. Speedometer, rear view, speedometer. And I miss the red light in front of me. Back home, some people still call me Red Light Rob. Well, I go ahead and pull on over because I wanted to, I know that he's going to want to talk to me about this. And it might be my arrogance to this day, thinking I got myself talked out of it. Wouldn't have been the first DUI I talked myself out of. And I just don't know and will never know because he started searching my car. Now, I've had classes. I know he can't do that. I know he knows he can't do that. He just doesn't know that I know. He can't do that. So I tell him. I said, excuse me, you can't search my car without my consent, unless, of course, I'm under arrest. (laughs) On the way to the police station... I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do, but he gets in there, and I blow in the breathalyzer, and at the time in South Carolina, the level was a 10. It's much lower than that now, but the level was a 10. I blow a 10. I kept my mouth shut. I heard a comedian one time said that he knew he had the right to remain silent, but the inability to do so, (laughs) because I know my rights. I know I've got the right to demand a blood test. I demand a blood test. Blood comes back 18. I'm on my way to law school having shown them who they were dealing with. (laughs) Now, there was a period of time in there where I could control when I started drinking. Never been able to control how much I drank when I started. But there was a little bit of time in there, and I wanted to do well in school, so I've got some handle over it, and then I lost it. I started making promises to myself I couldn't keep. Promises like, okay, I got something to do tomorrow. I'm not going to drink tonight. And about halfway into tonight, I'm thinking, why am I making such a big deal out of this? And I wind up drinking, now I'm off to the races again. Physical things started happening to me. I woke up one morning, couldn't move my foot up and down. I could move it side to side, but I couldn't move it up and down. had to clop to the clinic. And the first thing that the doctor asked me was how much I'd had to drink the night before. I told him about normal. That's always been a silly question for me. <laughs> if, I knew I, if I knew how much I had to drink, I hadn't drank enough. <laughs> but I am so grateful that that cured up on its own. But there was another place, there was a little bar I used to drink lunch at, and I remember going in there, 
ordering a beer about noon and reaching up for it. I'm about 23, 24 years old. And the lady behind the bar took my hand in both of hers and said, Oh, Robert, I am so sorry. I go, I'm just a little nervous. Beer two will help me out. Sure enough, got a beer two in me. Steady as a rock. Didn't have a clue that I was going through alcohol withdrawals. Worse yet was the stuff that was going on in my head right about this time. I would start off at some of the nicer bars dressed up like about I'm now, drinking top shelf liquor with the piano playing in the background, figuring out how I was going to run this thing one day. Before it's said and done, I'm at the sports bar. Now I've lost the tie, got the jacket, and I'm talking about the game. But then before it was said and done at night, I was at the pool hustle. Because there was a little, God, this was a dark, dank, scuzzy, scuzzy pool hall that I was wound up shooting pool. It was the kind of place that you walk into and your feet stick to the floor. <laughs> and you're pretty sure you don't want to know why. <laughs> could be beer. Could be blood. Nobody really wants to know, but that was my hangout because it stayed open to 6 o'clock in the morning. And so long as I was shooting pool, the way I could normally shoot pool, I could drink about that long. And now I've graduated law school. And things have gone really bad that last semester. And it got particularly bad when I got the application because... They got this like 10 page application to take the test after you get out of law school. And one of the first questions was, Do you have a problem with alcohol? Worse yet, I think the third or fourth question asked me for my arrest record. They asked me for my arrest record and only left me three spaces. <laughs> I had to attach a separate sheet. And I'm looking at this sheet, okay, by that time I had gotten three DUIs. I had gotten my license back. I hadn't had my license for three or four months. I got my third DUI. And finally, after that, it dawned on me, Robert, you just can't drink and drive. So I decided to give up driving. <laughs> I'm in Columbia, South Carolina. We got buses. I can make this work. The problem was I wasn't very good at drinking and walking either. <laughs> I'm looking down somewhere along the line. I had gotten about three or four public drunks. It, it used to kill me. I'd go to the bar, and it would cost me $2 to get a taxi cab from the bar home. And I would pay the $2, and that was back when I could get a pitcher of beer for $2. But I finally learned it better get the taxi cab home rather than risk another public drunk. I also started writing bad checks to pay for the booze because I learned that Heard a long time ago that you didn't need a pen to rob, I mean, you didn't need a gun to rob a bank. A pen will work just fine. <laughs> now, I'm looking at this list of my arrest record, and I'm thinking, you know, anybody that takes a look at that might think that I got a problem with alcohol. So now I got to do something, and I checked the box, yes, I have a problem. But then I immediately checked myself into the state treatment center to show them I'm trying to do something to help myself. Now, folks, I don't intend to stop drinking. I am building a resume. <laughs> because I know I got to go in front of this committee of folks that's going to decide whether or not I can take this test to be a lawyer. You go in there, I get out, I wind up at a homeless shelter, but that's okay. I was the only one there with a law degree. <laughs> I'm sober nine months, and I go in front of this committee of folks that's going to decide whether or not I could take this test. And I got to tell y'all, I spent all that time preparing for that meeting. And I got it. I got it. I got the chaplain from the treatment center there to explain the program of recovery and how well I had done while I was at the treatment center. I had the dean of the law school, the top dog of the law school there, to testify on my behalf. And I'm smooth. <laughs> until one guy started asking me questions I hadn't prepared for. Questions like, Mr. Hill, do you have a home group? <laughs> I said, no, sir, there's a lot of groups in Columbia, South Carolina. I am visiting around to find one I'm comfortable with. He said, Mr. Hill, do you have a sponsor? I said, no, but I've narrowed it down to a short list of people to interview. 
I did not realize at the time just how bad those answers were. <laughs> he knew. And he said, wait a year. They all said, wait a year. They didn't say no, they said, wait a year. And I'm saying, Psst. I can drink sober up in a year. Nobody will know. I had done such a good job of hiding it before. <laughs> Have y'all ever, I got to share a little bit about that to you, how that went back out. The way that happened, I went back to the same bar I was telling you about before. New bartender. I go to the bartender. I say, the guy's name was Bert. I know him to this day. I say, Bert, I'm Robert, and I'm an alcoholic. And there may come a day where I ask you to serve me a beer. If I do, don't do it. And if you say, no, I'm not going to do it, I'm going to ask you to forget that we had this conversation. <laughs> don't forget. But sure enough, that's how it played out. Bert, I want a beer. Rob just told me not to, you told me not to sell you a beer. Bert, forget we had the conversation. Rob just told me not to forget. We almost get into a fight <laughs> over whether or not this bartender is going to do his job. Well, he finally served me the beer. Have you all ever woken up or come to, and before you open your eyes, you know you don't know where you are? That's what happens to me. The second thought I had was, if the guy would have just done what I asked him to. <laughs> you know? Because I learned pretty early on that I don't have to accept responsibility for my own actions. I can always find somebody else to blame. And when you run out of people, you can blame God. Even a God you don't believe in. But I remember coming to, and it was just, it was just horrible. And at the time I had gotten out of the homeless shelter, and I was living with this guy, and then he moved out. And I was there by myself. I had been going to AA meetings for a number of years. I, my first introduction to AA is, I thank God for the guy, is I, when I got myself into the treatment center, I explained to my sister that I might drink a little too much, a little too often. And she got me bundled up for this guy to talk to me that the only reason she knew he was a member of AA is because he had told his minister that he was a member of AA and that if it came up with anybody had a drinking problem, he might be able to help. And that's how my sister needed to get me to him. He was the first person in my life that ever talked to me about their drinking rather than talking to me about my drink. And I am scared to death just listening to this guy, except for about 10, 15 minutes in, you know, you start thinking, particularly when he started talking about how Alcoholics Anonymous had changed his life. Oh, well, I don't know if I need my life changed now. Come on. <laughs> I just really need to get out of this little bit of trouble I'm in. What I really need is for you, somebody to help convince these people that I could take this test to be a lawyer. I knew not to ask for that. But that was my introduction to him. And I had been going to meetings, and they didn't work. And I'm there in that little apartment. I finally get myself out of the homeless shelter in that little apartment by myself. And the first part of the, the second part of the first step is complete. Because it got bad. The first part was always true. The first part was true because I don't ever recall a time starting drinking when I ever wanted to stop. I always had another drink. I remember back when I was 15, or, yeah, 15, a 17-year-old said, Robert, there ain't nothing wrong with drinking. You just don't have to drink so much. And I don't have a clue how you do that. But now the second part's complete, too. There's a lot of despair. I knew I really needed to check myself into a detox, but I was afraid they wouldn't let me out when I wanted out. I th- I saw the detox side and saw Hotel California. (laughs) So I did a lot of painful suffering, a lot of insomnia, a lot of sweats. And I knew I was powerless over alcohol, but I was so defiant. I was so defiant that it had finally gotten to the point where I knew that it was going to kill me. And alcohol did not get to decide when I died. I get to decide that. So I attempted suicide. i got to explain that a little bit. I, I've come to believe that there is nothing worse than a drinking drunk, drinking and thinking. But I'm sitting down there planning my death. And this is what I came up with. I'm in a small apartment. Small apartment's got a little tiny kitchen. Little tiny kitchen's got a gas stove. I get this old ratty recliner into the little kitchen. 
prop the TV set up on the sink. <laughs> plug the TV into the thing. Kick back on the recliner. Saved up money for a bottle of scotch. Single malt. I had been introduced. Woohoo! You're right. <laughs> And I knew at that point, the denial had gone. I knew when I started drinking, I was going to pass out. The only difference was, was this time, this time, I wasn't going to wake up. There was a flaw in this plan. That dawned on me when I went to light my fourth or fifth cigarette. And the cigarette lighter popped up a little higher than normal. And I had what our book calls a moment of clarity. <laughs> when I realized I could blow myself up. <laughs> and I did not want to burn to death. So say what y'all want to about cigarette smoking. Once upon a time, it saved my life. <laughs> now you would think that that was enough to get my attention to do what I needed to do, but the problem wasn't getting my attention. Alcohol had gotten my attention. The problem was I didn't see a way out. I didn't. Finally, my boss saved my life. I had a role in saving my life by getting me into outpatient treatment. And there, was a, there was a guy there who was my age. I was 24. 24? 24. No, 28. Somewhere in my 20s. They were hazy. And I went up to him and I said, look, you've got to find something other than AA to help me because I've been going to AA means for four years. AA doesn't work for me. And he said, excuse me? <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, I've been going to AA for four years. You've got to find something super duper for me. <laughs> he said, Robert, that's your problem. Your problem is never been that the issue was whether or not AA would work for you. The issue has always been whether or not you were willing to work for it. I said, you're not listening to me. I've been going to meetings for four years. And he said, I heard you. I heard you the first time. But I hadn't heard you say anything about working the steps. Why don't you give the steps a shot before you write this thing off? I said, okay. But now i got major problems because I'm at step two. And I've sat in meetings, and I know y'all. Y'all say higher power this, higher power that. But you're talking about God. And if God's part of this thing, I'll drink and die. Thank you very much. I was so angry. God and I cut a deal pretty early on. You leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. I remember waking up at a concrete floor in the Richland County Jail. No mattress. Cold. Praying the foxhole prayer or starting to pray the foxhole prayer for help. And I stopped myself because I didn't want to break the deal. I wanted to maintain my own sense of integrity. <laughs> you see, God had killed my father. I allowed it to happen. And I was waiting for him to apologize. The treatment center counselor came to my rescue again. He said, Robert, the only thing the second step asks you to do is come to believe in something. The first part of step 12 talks about having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Maybe you'll find what you need somewhere between step 2 and step 12. Okay? So now I'm in step 3, and step 3 wasn't a problem because the only thing I decided that I was going to decide was to work the rest of the steps. But now I'm at step 4. Oh, goodness. I used to sit in fourth step meetings, talk about how to work the step, thinking I'm working the step, talking about how to work it. <laughs> We'd have these grand debates. <laughs> Is it four columns or five? Do you put it on white paper, yellow paper? <laughs> line paper, unlined paper. <laughs> well, you're sitting down there and throughout all these debates. I got to tell you, just a few years back, I went back to my first home group and there was this lady there that was there from the very beginning, same coffee pot, same table. And I said, you remember when you sit around this table arguing about how to do the fourth step? She goes, oh, yeah, I tell newcomers about that all the time. I said, really? What do you tell them? She said, well, I'll tell them me and this guy used to argue about how to do the fourth step. I went ahead and did it and stayed sober. 
and he didn't and didn't. <laughs> and that about sums that up. <laughs> when I actually started doing it, though, I had a couple of revelations I got to share with you. Number one, the most meaningful song to me afterwards when I realized what happened was Jimmy Buffett's Wasted Away Again in Margaritaville. Talk about waking up with strange tattoos. Blaming a woman. We can do that. Or saying, okay, it's, may, maybe it's really nobody's fault. Uh, it may be my fault. Yeah, it's my fault. And when I got to the role that I played in it, it was a it was transforming. The other thing, it dawned on me working through that process that God did not kill my father. It's a 17 year old girl. And out of all the times I drank and drove, it could have very easily been me. And had it been me, that would have been on me. That wouldn't have been on God. So I was able to get over that and give God a break. And that kind of punched a hole in this wall that I had built up to let a little sunlight of the Spirit in. Just enough to get me to the fifth step. Because once I reached those revelations looking at the piece of paper, I had to share it with somebody. The guy that I shared it with was seven years sober. He might as well have said 7D, 700. I couldn't picture staying sober that long. But I'm in there and I'm talking to him, sharing with my deepest, darkest secrets in the fifth step. And I got to tell you, he ain't batting an eye. I'm thinking about making up stuff just to get his attention. (laughs) But after I share with him, he shared with me some of the things that he was going through. (laughs) There were some areas of his life, he was sick. (laughs) He He was much sicker at seven years than I was at seven months. And that gave me hope. That's where I got the hope that this program has to offer. In the middle of that fifth step, I did not get the hope Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer sitting in a meeting talking about hope. I got the hope Alcoholics Anonymous had to offer in the middle of that fifth step. Now I'm looking at the sixth and seventh, and I used to think I had grand character defects. The normal run of the mill. Fear. Pride. Self-seeking, selfishness, self-centeredness, all of that. And I was ready to let all that go. And then I started knowing the amends that I had to make from the fourth step and started making the amends. At this point, I'm about nine months sober, and I I move and I take a job with this uh, law firm. not a lawyer. They still won't let me take the test yet. But I'm down there, and I'm getting to about five meetings a week, and I'm doing the deal. And at about a year and a half, a group pops up and asks me to serve as their general service representative. And I've looked at the servicemen, and I know that it was suggested two years, but I also realized that my group had just recognized my incredible spiritual maturity. (laughs) Come to find out, it was just my turn. And I was so incredibly grateful looking back that I was in a group, wound up in a group that took turns doing that, because it's a brand new world. I get to the area assembly where the GSRs meet in South Carolina, and we've got stuff going on. I didn't have a clue we had going on. And it was so much more involved to this fellowship than the hour-long meeting I was at in my AA group. Doing that, they finally let me take the test. I finally become a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. I'm going to the meetings. I'm doing the area assemblies. I'm doing the service work. I'm traveling all over the little districts. I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And before I know it, I'm seven years old but I have a hole in my soul because I'm not married and I want to get married. And I knew I was going to have to marry an AA because I got to tell, I don't want to have to try to explain this to anybody. (laughs) (laughs) So now while I'm doing all this service work, traveling all over the place, I'm keeping my eye out. (laughs) Multitasking. And I started dating this lady. I'm seven years sober. She's five years sober. It was horrible. God, it was so bad. I was going through things at age 35. I should have gone through at age 15 and never did. 
think things like, does she like me? <laughs> Will she answer up a call? It got so bad I had to talk to my sister. I needed a feminine perspective on this. And the first thing out of my sister's mouth, she goes, wait a minute, I know some girls. So she set me up on a blind date. A blind date. That was the Saturday after Thanksgiving in 1996. We are married that next March. (laughs) I'm not suggesting that to anyone, but I'm so incredibly grateful it worked out for me. This coming about a few weeks, it'll be our 23rd wedding anniversary. And now I'm married, and I'm still trying to do the deal, but I've rotated out of the positions that I was in in AA, and I'm focused on work, and she focused on work, and, and we're, we're making this marriage thing go. And I got to explain to you just a little bit of time explaining how you could work the steps backwards. For me, the first thing that went was the area assemblies, the GSR meetings, because I didn't have a position, didn't see a reason to be there, no point in making the trip to go and do that kind of thing. The second thing that went was working with newcomers. I ain't working with newcomers. I work with people that work with newcomers. It's aggravating. I ain't doing it no more. (laughs) Cutting myself off from the lifeblood that this program has to offer. The next thing to go was all the AA meetings I was going to because it was a fairly small group I was going to. I'm sitting there. I know what they're going to say. This one guy says about three things, and two sentences into his share, I know which one of the three it's going to be. Worse yet, it dawned on me they know what I'm going to say. So I wonder why I'm there. So now that dwindles down. But have no fear, because me and God, we got it going on. I have had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. When I woke up one morning and realized I hadn't had the desire to drink the day before. And I knew that that was something greater than me. Frankly, in my mind, the God of my understanding, something greater than you all. But there was something there where I realized I hadn't had the desire to drink. There wasn't a day that went by from my when me throwing up in the eighth grade until that day so many years later. I either wasn't thinking about drinking, drinking, or thinking about not drinking. And I went a whole day without any of that. So now I'm seeking God's guidance, the way the 11th step suggests. And in the middle of a prayer seeking God's guidance, it dawns on me, wait a minute, I can handle that. I don't need to take that to God. And as time goes on, there's more and more things that I can handle and less and less things I take to God in prayer. But my sponsor's okay with all this. See, I was sponsoring myself. <laughs> I used to go through this ritual. I had a ritual. Well, well, Robert, what do you think? (laughs) Yeah, I think I'll be fine. (laughs) Pretty soon the amends aren't getting made because you know you don't have to make amends if you're never wrong. (laughs) Looking back, I have convinced that I worked myself all the way back down to step two where the only thing between me and a drink was the thought. And the God of my understanding spared me that because I hadn't thought about drinking. Now, I had thought about killing quite often because I was being horribly mistreated at work. Looking back, I'm exaggerating in my mind how bad it was, but it was pretty bad. And I came to appreciate that part of the serenity prayer that talked about changing the things that you can. And I had a say over where I worked, so I started out on my own, just me. No secretary, no paralegal, just me. And made a go of it that way. And I quickly realized that there wasn't a month that went by, I didn't do something, I wouldn't fire somebody for doing. But then I'd have to hire myself back. So, <laughs> And I'm doing that and I get back into Alcoholics Anonymous, get back into the area assemblies, get back into the service work, and lo and behold, South Carolina, Area 62, elected me as their delegate to serve at the General Service Conference in 2008 and 2009. I always thought that God had a sense of humor by naming area South Carolina Area 62 to remind me of Rule 62 to remind me not to take myself so serious. 
because it would have eaten my lunch if I'd have taken myself too serious during that. I really can't explain what the general service conference is like. I'm, it's kind of like if, if you sat at a group business meeting, imagine doing that for a week. And that's about the best way I can describe it. In the middle of all this, I had a guy pop up and ask me to sponsor him. And I said, oh, well, let's talk about it. And I actually had him want to give a delegates report. And I talked to him and come to find out he was about a year sober. And his major problem was his girlfriend was about two weeks sober. And I quickly agreed, yeah, he had a problem. <laughs> but I didn't hear back from him. And come to find out he died. And he took her with him. They both went out and he wrapped his truck around a tree. And I'm thinking in my head, you know, that's not supposed to happen. I am the delegate from South Carolina. And I cannot keep a sponsee alive. So I got to take some meaning from that. And this is the meaning that I took from that alcohol will kill you. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care who your sponsor is. It will kill you. And that's easy for me to forget. Because when you get involved in certain kinds of service, service that is vital to the fellowship, but certain kinds of service, you're dealing with other people that clean up well just like you do. And you can very easily forget that this thing will take you down. No mercy. And that's what I got from that. After having served as a delegate and got took that lesson, I'm getting back, and I'm back in South Carolina, and South Carolina, bless its heart, has very few things that past delegates can do for a reason. There's a good reason for that. Couldn't get rid of us. Let us do a lot. Um, but one of the things I did, I, I was able to chair a convention back in 2013. I promised myself I'd never do that again. This past November, I chaired a service assembly in North Carolina. I had a ball doing that. But I also allowed myself to stand for regional trustee. This was back in 2013. And I lost. And my feelings got hurt. But I immediately called up the guy who was elected, this fellow down in Florida, and, and congratulated him and told him how proud I was of him and, and for him. Because I knew in my heart that something was going to happen to make me realize that that worked out just the way it was supposed to work out. And it didn't take too long. Um, later that year, my wife got sick. She got real sick. She almost died. And I was able to take care of her there in the hospital and take care of her when she got out. In the middle of all that, she said, you know you wouldn't be able to do this if you'd have been elected trustee. I said, I know. But I also knew I wouldn't have been able to do it had I not stood. Because preparing to stand for trustee, I had worked my work schedule in a way to open up blocks of time to do what I needed to do to serve you. And God took that time to allow me to serve her. And she was so sick. I got she, she got so sick, and then when she got out, she had to take IV antibiotics that made her sick, and she started vomiting. And she didn't know how. She would stand in front of the toilet, flat-footed, put her hands on her hips, <laughs> bend over, trying to aim. I go, no, baby, no, I've got to get down now. <laughs> she did not appreciate my advice. I was just sharing experience, strength, and hope. <laughs> but we got through that, and several other things worked out. And what I'd, I'd like to close, because I think at this point, I'm probably at the last part of step 12. I told you a little bit about where I was with step 11 and, and, and discovering. I was going to say discovering or finding God, but I always remember there was, there was this lady in my home group once upon a time. She said, honey, God ain't lost. <laughs> so by, by doing the step 11 and step 12, and I share with you a little bit about that, I, I do this every so often, and I'm still as active as they'll let me be. Um, 
sponsoring folks and, and trying to carry the message that way. But let me end just the last few moments I have with five quick stories because it goes to really the way that I was like and what happened and what I'm like now, talking about family, because that's part of practicing these principles in all our affairs because family's tough. And I would like to share, start off with my first stepfather. And when I say my first stepfather, it kind of gives you an idea. It's kind of like my DUIs. There was more than one. My mother wound up outliving four husbands. She didn't divorce any of them. She just outlived them. And I can promise you she didn't make a dime off any of them. But the first one was a Southern Baptist minister. Now, if any of y'all had bad thoughts when I said Southern Baptist minister, this guy was a poster child for that. And, and this is not the 15-year-old Robert Hill saying this. This is the 57-year-old Robert Hill saying this. This guy was truly a piece of work. And I was going to let him know. I was going to tell him off exactly what I thought about him, but I knew I had to wait because if I'd have done it too quick, he'd have just dismissed it as drunk talk. So I figured, okay, I'm going to wait a year. I'm going to get my birthday cake, get my chip, let him have it. <laughs> And the old man up and died on me before I could get a year in. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. I am at the cemetery at the graveside talking to the dirt. Talk to dirt. Talk to dirt. And I caused my mother pain. Because she had just lost her second husband. And I was there making this all about me. She remarried. And I loved this guy. This guy was a great guy. Once upon a time, my mom was in my ear, and he said, Ruth, leave the boy alone. He's hungover. He can't pay you no mind. And she said, well, Charlie, the boy's either drunk or hungover all the time. <laughs> when am I supposed to talk to him? When he passed away, he died in a hospital full of family and love, and I was holding his hand. And I was able to bring my mother some comfort. Now, I don't know how you get from there to there. I can't explain it. I really can't describe it that well. I just know that it's the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the redeeming and transforming power of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous because I, I, I don't have directions there. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my mom. Back when I tried to kill myself, things were so bad. And I, I was hitting her up for money pretty regularly. I didn't have a job. I was un, unemployed, unemployable. And I remember one time I brought her to tears because she said, do you just want me to go ahead and die to get whatever you need or get anything you can for me now? And I remember thinking that that wasn't such a bad idea. Later on, she had a stroke and had to go into an assisted living facility. And she started calling me her office manager because I took care of her finances. Right after she got in, I got her to a pharmacy and she did a little look like fingernail polish and all that kind of stuff. The bill came to about $20. I went ahead and paid it. Didn't think much of it. Then we got back to her place and she leaned in close and said, you know, you can take that money out of my account. One too long after that, she started telling me her story and what it was like losing four husbands, growing up in a mill hill in South Carolina during the Depression. And she talked and she talked, and I listened and I listened, and she talked some more and I listened some more. And I gave her the greatest gift and made the greatest amends to her that I could have. I did not interrupt, and I listened. And she finished, and I walked away amazed because throughout all of that, she never once mentioned my drinking. This was the lady who told me that she was so afraid every time the phone rang because she knew this time, this time, it was going to be the police calling letting her know that they had found my body. And that relationship was healed. One too long after that, she passed away. She died on a Tuesday and the Friday before that. My sister and I had taken her out to lunch and I had gotten her back to her place. And on the way out, she said, I'm glad you had a chance to visit. We always have fun. And you always tell me I'm pretty. 
And that's my last memory of my mother alive. How do you get that? I don't know, except for the redeeming and transforming power of the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now a quick story on my mother-in-law. My wife was going to be here with me this weekend, but come to find out it's my mother-in-law's 90th birthday today. She's kicking. Her husband passed away a number of years ago. I think it's been about 10 or 11 years ago. And, and she shared with me that she started keeping a journal to help her grieve. And she let me know that she wrote down in her journal that she knew her husband was in heaven letting my father know that he has a son in law. Now I got to give you an idea about what that kind of change was like. Back when I was shooting pool in that dark, dank pool hall, every so often I'd try to expand my horizons and try to have, try my, my luck with the ladies. I tried to pick up this one lady one night, and she wasn't having any of it. I can't imagine why. <laughs> uh, but she went off to the bathroom, and this other girl came up, a friend of mine, and said, Robert, you don't want to mess with her. I said, oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and she said, no, you don't. She vomits and rolls around in it. I just figured we had something in common. <laughs> and besides, if a little vomit is for sex, I can do that. <laughs> that is a price I'm willing to pay. <laughs> now, how in the world do you get from there to having your mother-in-law tell that kind of story about having had me as a son-in-law being so proud. I don't know. But I got to owe it to the redeeming and transforming power of the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Two quick stories, and I think I'm on time. Last one's about my wife. The next to the last one's about my wife. My wife is a church lady. If we've ever had any issues throughout the marriage, it's been that. We've negotiated a truce. <laughs> But she is a church musician, and by, by that, I got introduced. We used to live in a small town in South Carolina called Newberry, South Carolina. It's a very small place. If anybody knows Newberry. And I met the community choir director who wanted to get me involved in doing some of this work with her. They had Easter and Christmas programs every year. I'm not interested in being involved in an Easter or Christmas program. But she stayed after me and stayed after me. I said, okay. It was an Easter program. And she said, exactly what do you want me to do? She said, Robert, you'd make a great Judas. <laughs> I got no interest in being Judas in an Easter program. <laughs> but she said, here, look at the script. Look at the script. Now, I got to tell you, don't go out and say Robert Hill says this is in the Bible. I know it's not in the Bible. But whoever wrote the script gave Judas some great lines. <laughs> Stuff like, it's not my fault. <laughs> I think I can pull this off. <laughs> so I'm doing this, and it's going pretty well. And my wife's asking me, she said, how are you doing this? I said, I just remember once upon a time, nothing was ever my fault. And she says, I cannot imagine you ever being dishonest. <laughs> now, how did that happen? <laughs> this is from a lady we've been married to for a number of years who's heard my story enough times for her to tell it if she had to. And there I go. Now, how did that happen? I don't know. Except for the redeeming and transforming power of the steps of this book. One last story. When I was in the homeless shelter, there were three kind of people in the world. There were people that could hurt me, people that could help me, and people I didn't care about one way or the other. And my primary goal in life was to take the people that could hurt me, change you into someone that could help me, and use you up. That's what I had to do to be able to drink the way I drank. Today, I know people all over the place. I've got friends from all over, and it's more than just that. As soon as I got here, y'all made me feel so comfortable. This is a fantastic convention, and y'all made me feel so comfortable, and it's like people who I love, and I know who love me, and I wouldn't have gotten at any other place except here, almost drinking myself to death. And I thank you for that. Thanks.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.